Mr. Terrell, are you still driving, sir? Uh, I'm pulling over right now. I'm okay, get us, I can't have you driving, participating in a hearing. I can't imagine anything more dangerous. We're here on Mr. Garza's application to set aside conviction. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Natalie May Cumber on behalf of the people. And then, sir, are you um, Dominic Joseph Garza? Yes, sir. And Mr. Garza, are you representing yourself in this application to set aside? Yes, I am. Okay, so you're not represented by an attorney, correct? No, sir. All right. And these are all victims? Yes, Your Honor. The home that was involved in this case is Jason and Carrie's home. Emma, Fritz, and Joshua are their children. Joshua and Fritz were in the home the night that this happened and were part of the assault that took place during that incident. Emma was fortunate enough to not be in the home that night, but has suffered severe trauma since this night based on the events that happened. All right. And then um, Ms. Maycumber, I have received the letter from the Attorney General indicating that Mr. Garza uh, may be eligible to have his conviction set aside under MCL 780.621. You are here on behalf of the prosecuting attorney um, as opposed to representing the state of Michigan, the attorney general's office. Have you received any information besides that letter from the attorney general's office or any indication they're going to participate in this hearing? I have not, Your Honor. All right. Then um, before we get into some of the other uh, requirements of the statute, what is the uh, prosecuting attorney's position as to, I guess I'll frame it as legal eligibility in terms of the the time frames required under the statute, the excluded um, types of convictions and that sort of thing, which is what is addressed in part by the attorney general's letter, although not in very much detail. Your Honor, in strictly looking at the crime and at the time frame. It is a little confusing based on the application that we have, based on the judgment of sentence that we have. It appears that he would be eligible based on the time frame. However, the discharge information on the certified criminal history does not match up with the judgment of sentence that we have on file with the court. Um, in speaking with the trials today, they were under the impression that Mr. Garza was able to participate in SAI boot camp, which would match up to the certified criminal history information that we have. Um, I don't have any documentation from MDOC to show whether or not he did participate in that program and whether or not that was successful, um, just that he was discharged and based on the discharge date on the certified criminal history the time length would be appropriate for him to apply. And so what you're saying is if we were to look at the minimum sentence, the earliest release date, calculating from January 28, with only two days credit, that followed by a period of parole would probably not be, he would probably not have cleared the five-year period. But because of the information that you have that there was a transfer to the special alternative incarceration program, then the dates might match up. That's correct, Your Honor. Mr. Garza, um, did you in fact go from the Department of Corrections initial intake to um, the special alternative incarceration program? Yes, I did, sir. All right, and when was that transfer? When did you move to that program? Did you successfully complete the SAI program? Yes, I did. Do you know when you completed it? In uh, June, June sometime. I had to go there June, for June three of months, 2015. I June of 2015. Yes. yes, sir. And then were you supervised um, under supervised parole after that point in time? 
I was on house arrest, I think. And then when were you, when did you complete your supervised uh, parole? Do you know? Uh, I, yeah, I believe it was in 2016. So Ms. Maycumber, the prosecutor's position is that he does qualify in terms of meet, meeting the statutory requirements of the um, time frame and the type of crime that can be that the uh, conviction can be set aside. That would be correct, Turner. This is a home invasion first degree. Then, with respect to um, the prosecutor's position as to the discretionary aspect um, and any uh, victim in, input, I assume all these individuals are here because of the statutory requirement for notice given the type of crime that the notice was provided to the victims is that why they're here that's correct your honor our office did send a letter to the family to let them know about this hearing our office failed in letting them know that it was going to be a zoom hearing so they drove all the way up here um, after working all night long, um, family members' support came all the way up from a different state to come be here with the family today to speak out against this expungement hearing. Okay, go ahead, ma'am. What would you like me to know? Um, I wrote it out. Um, I'd first like to thank you for the opportunity to make this statement. Um, it's it's very hard to force ourselves to relive the traumatic events that took place the night that Dominic Garza broke into our home more than we already do just to put into words the daily effect this has had on our lives all the stress from this incident and everything that followed has caused irreparable trauma and ptsd like symptoms for us at times it makes us physically sick we get nauseous and migraines and so on the whole situation has stripped us of our confidence and dignity and left us with overwhelming feelings of vulnerability not a day has gone by that we haven't felt unsafe in our home the very place we ought to feel the most secure. This, there's a constant uneasy feeling being at home for fear of another home invasion that will never go away. Sleep is lost every night due to this. Many of our irreplaceable personal items of sentimental value were also taken from our home to be used as evidence in this case. Things like family photos that were stored on digital cameras and phones. These things were never returned to us even after we asked for them. I'm sorry. The person before you today stole our sense of security that night. And our permanent and our physical belongings were also taken because of what he did. Our son who was removed from our care tem temporarily due to our home being invaded had a very difficult time adjusting to be with, being without his parents. He has many learning and speech delays from the psychological trauma, the defendant's actions uh, from the defendant's actions that will also continue to affect him for the rest of his life. The consequences Dominic Garza received were essentially a slap on the wrist, but more a face, uh, slap in the face of justice as well as ours. He should still be in prison, but instead he took a plea deal to drop the multiple assault with dangerous weapon charges from holding our family at gunpoint. Let's not forget, he is someone we have never met before. He watched us for months and then broke into our home when he thought there would be only women and children at home. He threatened to, sh to shoot and pointed a loaded gun at our son, who was only eight months old at the time, if we didn't comply. He then tried to shoot Mr. Terrell in the head multiple times while, while he was struggling to, protect, to try and protect our family. At the sentencing, this monster showed absolutely no remorse for his actions towards us. He was more concerned with apologizing for the hardship he placed on his family than he was for terrorizing ours. Please don't forget these things because we surely can't no matter how hard we try. These are things that never leave us. The kind of person that would not only plan out for several months but then follow through to commit these crimes is not the kind of person who should be allowed this opportunity today. He is a danger to society and that title should not be removed from his name. When you wake up from an extremely frightening nightmare, you feel a huge sense of relief to know that you were safe and it was all a dream. However, our home being invaded was not a dream. There is no waking up from this nightmare. If this record is expunged, we are certain more people are likely to suffer the same nightmare from this menace to society. Expungements should be reserved for victimless crimes, 
not the heinous actions of the, this criminal in this case. Any semblance of justice will not allow for this crime to be forgotten. Dominic Garza should have to live with real consequences of his actions. Our family is forced to live with what he did to us every day and night for the rest of our lives. It doesn't just go away for us and it shouldn't for him either. Thank you. All right, thank you, ma'am. Okay. Go ahead, sir. Um, yeah, the uh, pretty much a recap of uh, what they all said. I, you know, I get myself two hours, three hours of sleep, have panic attacks constantly, uh, anxiety, uh, and then through the course of, you know, uh, what happened, his home invasion, um, somehow whatever deal got me to where he got off, you know, lighter than me. Uh, my wife had, you know, uh, a pistol and because I, you know, the, the cops wanted to get some kind of a thing on me, they are just rampaging through and, you know, tried to charge me for having a pistol. Like, uh, it got turned around more like, uh, you know, like we were the intruders and he came in with heinous intent. He specifically said that he was, you know, stalking our house for three months or more. Like, um, this is just, this is not human behavior that he is displaying. He should be in some kind of an institution. I have no idea why it is that he got three months for trying to murder my family. He almost blew my head off a bunch of times um, as I was struggling with the gun. Uh, luckily, uh, my wife had, he said, take, you know, take me upstairs. And luckily, she walked him to my door instead. And I, you know, I got up in time. Because otherwise, like, you know, like uh, they've said before, we'd all be dead. You know, he came in there with a mask. Uh, he was waiting for my car to be in the shop uh, or my, my car to be gone for me to be away. And he was going to go pick it with innocent women and children, a, a woman and a bunch of children. And that is like, that's, that's not human behavior. And Frankly, I, I have no idea what kind of deal he cut to get a few months for this and why the other charges were dismissed and, you know, why this got turned around to us. Like, but the immense suffering and anxiety and panic and insomnia that all of us face now, you know, I'm, I'm glad if he got to, you know, go make a deal and turn whoever else in, whatever it was that he got the sweetheart deal. I don't believe that that was remotely justice. It was really hard to swallow that the victims got more punishment than the perpetrator. How on earth he got out with a few months and he was not even staying on his guidelines of what he was supposed to do, you know, for the uh, probationary. He had no kind of remorse. He uh, at one point approached us at a bowling alley and then all of a sudden there's a bunch of them standing behind me and my children there's no remorse there and then uh when we went into court he you know blew me a kiss and did this at me you know like what's next what is this a you know i wait till i see him and then it's all fucking like i, I don't know where i'm supposed to get peace of mind here you know this guy's just you know sitting here just basically unaffected from it he should be in prison in a very very bad prison like that's not something that people do that is absolutely out of line for you know the social contract or however you want to put it you know the fact that he got out of this however he got out of this is ridiculous and I just absolutely don't feel that it's fair to society or my family to take this mark off of him. So this is something that's not gonna disappear from us. This is something that we're gonna live with for the rest of our lives. And luckily I stopped the murder and rape and robbery from happening, but just barely. And for, for it to even be considered for him to ever get this warning label off of him is insane. And the, the blood will be on everybody's hands for doing it. It's just. I hope that you guys can recognize this is not a normal person. He needs to be watched. He definitely does not need to have the warning label taken off that he is down to go and break in and rape and murder and stalk and just do nutty stuff like that. 
you know, and there was no remorse. There was no, it's just insane. Like off of, off of us defending our family and me successfully not having our family murdered, my wife who was completely able to have a pistol, I got a charge and I got in more trouble than he did over, you know, I was fighting for my life. This guy was strung out on God knows what, had two stolen guns on him and, you know, breaks in the house with a mask, with ski, ski masks and all this kind of stuff. It just, it is insane that it's even being brought up to contemplate to take this warning label off of him. We, we went through years of much worse than he got for God knows what reason. I don't know, again, you know, the specifics of what sweetheart deal he got, but this, that was, it was really hard to take, you know, it's like a slap in the face to say the least, you know, like, because it, we had a continued problem and now we all, you know, suffer from not being able to sleep at night and being paranoid because there's freaking animals here that are getting to skirt by from, I don't know, setting up his friends or whatever, however he got out of this. It blows my mind that he got out of this, that he's not still in the cage right now. This should be a parole hearing, if anything. Okay, thank you, sir. Ms. Maycumber, before I turn to you, I'm gonna ask Mr. Garza to uh, tell me as is required under the statute uh, to hear his reasons and what he's been doing, his reasons for making this request and uh, what he has done since uh, completing his uh, sentence, Mr. Garza. Uh, yes, sir. Um, since I uh, was released from boot camp, um, I started um, searching for a job. I had to pay bills and restitution and um, help out with, because I had to stay with my brother uh, afterwards. I had to help out there. Uh, I ended up working at over by uh, farm. Uh, they were gracious enough to uh, help me reintegrate um, into the workforce. Um, my boss there actually was released from Muskegon after uh, a 25 year uh, sentence. So he was uh, helpful in that matter. I worked there for two years. Um, after I worked there, I went to I ended up being the team leader there after uh, starting off just as a general laborer. I worked there for two years. Uh, around that time, I became a, a youth minister for Compassion Ministries. Um, I work with maybe six or seven youth. We are a small small church. I had my, uh, my pastor, uh, right in and as my parole officer feels okay at that time. Um, I worked for two years and then after that I went to incorporated in Hudsonville uh, to drive OTR semi trucks and I did that for uh, two years also acquired my CDO class A um, and then after that I proceeded to uh, move on to drive for a company that's contracted for CATA to drive the spec train, which is the little white van. Um, actually got off of on schedule today at 1.30 for the hearing today. Um, but their understanding of that and I, which I greatly appreciate because with my record, nobody has to give me any chances for anything, which is understandable. Um, since I've been out from boot camp, I, I have zero contact with uh, any authority as far as on the wrong side of the law. Um, I try my best to, to help others and give back in whatever way I can. Because I know from the night that of my actions um, for the home invasion, I can never truly give back the, the sense of security that I took from the trails. And I, I again would like to apologize 
wholeheartedly to that family for just for everything that happened that night. It took away your sense of security. And, and I know that's such a hard, almost impossible thing to get back, which I truly hope that you can someday. I believe around that time, I was, I just turned 18, maybe four or five months before that happened. And I was just young, impulsive. I, I didn't have my head on straight at all. I would just go off of reaction and, and, and I wish I could, I wish with everything I have, I could turn back and, and just never, never do that. Because it was just such, it was an occurrence that did not need to happen. And I wish it never did. From, from that moment on, I can't even, I can imagine what they had to go through. Have you been involved in any counseling since you were released from boot camp? I, I had to go through uh, uh, for marijuana. When I got out, it was part of my, uh, as part of the order for the drug, uh, whatever drug program they have for, uh, in addition to that. But I completed that, I think that was a month long and, and, and I completed that. Um, but that was the only, uh, the only other program and community service, which I completed also. And in terms of the felony record, is there, um, well, first of all, the job you have now, that's something you plan to stay in or? Um, I actually have something in line for uh, so because this is just a contractor's company. They know my situation, human resources over there, uh, which she's already discussed with uh, her, her higher ups. Um, I'm aligned to get in uh, pending the outcome of this on the 16th for a class uh, for. So are you saying the felony record is something that would prevent you from taking that step or not? It, it would. I, I couldn't. I completed all their prerequisites. And then with the background check, they had to halt it because of the, uh, the felony, just because of the the nature, uh, it was a violent felony. All right, is there anything else you'd like me to know before I decide? Um, since that time, I mean, I've, I've really, I've gotten my head on straight. I, I haven't gotten into any trouble. I, you know, I tried to do the right thing as far as advising younger people to not do what I did. To, to help change their mentality or steer them in the right direction. I just tried to do what I couldn't do um, before all this happened. How old are you, sir? Are you, are you 29? I'll be 29 this year. Okay, Ms. Maycumber, um, the prosecutor's position and input? Your Honor, based on obviously the statements that we heard today from the victim family, the heinous nature of this crime, the severity of the crime that the defendant was charged with, I understand that statutorily he has met the low burden of not committing a crime within the five years from his sentencing being ended. We don't really have any information as to how boot camp happened. But that was not the intent of what his sentence was. It was not the intent of what the agreement was by our office. It was not the intent of what the judgment of sentence was by the court. Um, and, and I'm not, I guess, proposing that anything nefarious took place in, in how boot camp happened. But more so, Your Honor, that because of the crime and because of the severity, there needed to be some sort of match as far as the punishment in the sentence. And that's what this court originally gave to Mr. Garza and had 
MDOC followed that sentence the way it was intended, he would not be eligible today to have this crime expunged. I can appreciate the steps he's taken since getting out of, of MDOC and, and completing boot camp. I can appreciate the fact that he hasn't committed any new crimes, but there's just really no assurances other than that, that he's been able to provide to the court that he has in place a structure that will make sure that he does not go back to any sort of criminal behavior. Um, he's told the court that he had some court ordered treatment as far as marijuana use, but there's been no actual therapy. There's been no really deep dive into what brought him to the point that he decided that it was an okay situation to case a house for months at a time, break in and hold a family at gunpoint, threatening to shoot their children um, all over in his own words, were some TVs is what he ends up telling police he's there to do is to take some televisions because he's out of a job. Um, I, you know, honor, I would respectfully ask that this court not expunge this crime at this time um, and ask Mr. Garza to, I know the court can't order him, but ask him to really take a deep dive into what brought him to that situation and, and do some inner work on that before trying to apply again. All right. Thank you, Ms. Maycumber. Anything else you want to tell me, Mr. Garza? Uh, yes, sir. Um, since that time, I, I have had a solid work history. Um, every job I've had since then has, as hard as it's been with a felony, um, which I, looking back, I had no idea even thinking about something like that. Uh, it has been, I guess, uh, a step ahead trying to lose this, the stigmatism of a felony because that's a, a mark that, uh, that weighs heavily, which, which it should for what I did. Um, I've, I've tried to move in a better direction. And, I really hope that you see that I, I really am trying to, to do better. Um, I hope you see that I, I am doing a better job um, and being a, a, a better person for society. All right, thank you. The um, statute uh, under which this application has been filed is a relatively new statute, parts of it took effect as recently as uh, March 9th of 2022. And um, in some ways, Ms. Maycumber realizes this through some of these hearings that we've had before, in some ways there are parts of the statute that are not, um, let's say have not been fully interpreted and leave some question as to what some parts of it mean or what the intent was. I do know that in answer to the family, the victims who have commented, uh, more than one of them have indicated that expungements should be, essentially that expungements should be reserved for victimless crimes or at least certainly not for a, client, a crime that, that was as heinous as this one was, um, that would be an issue for the legislature. They apparently didn't see it that way. Uh, they did not uh, mandate that uh, only victimless crimes could be uh, set aside, nor did they in particular address the nature of the specific facts of a crime um, when, they, uh, when they put this statute together in terms of legal eligibility. They did do um, one thing though, which is not surprising and that has been exercised here today. And that is they indicate that the victim has the right to appear at any proceeding under this act concerning that conviction and to make a written or oral statement. That's what allows the victims to speak here today. And they also have a um, provision that allows the prosecuting attorney 
to contest the application, right? Either the prosecuting attorney or the attorney general. Um, the provision with regard to uh, having victims speak or provide a written statement, as I said, it's not surprising. It's consistent with our Victims' Rights Act in the state. Um, but there is one part of the statute that I think um, is not clear, and that is the extent to which and to weigh the victim's statements considering that there were impact statements that are part of our sentencing process, how does the victim's um, statements uh, weigh or calculate into my decision at the time of the request to set aside? Because when it goes to the issue of what I am to exercise discretion over, it doesn't address the victims at all. So you have a part of the statute that says the victims have the right to speak. So obviously you can presume that there's supposed to be some consideration of the victim's um, position. But then it goes on to say that um, the court is supposed to determine whether the circumstances and behavior of the applicant from the date of the applicant's conviction or convictions to the filing of the application warrant setting aside the conviction or convictions and that setting aside the conviction or convictions is consistent with public welfare. That's really a focus on what the defendant has done since the conviction and up to the date of the request for um, setting aside the conviction. So it's an interesting, um, I don't know if you can call it a disconnect, but they, the statute certainly does not tie those two things together in a very direct way, um, but rather, um, I suppose, more of an indirect. And I think probably the reason for that is that the legislature knows that the victim's position is supposed to be part of the sentencing and what the expungement statute was mostly directed at, as far as I can tell, mostly directed at what happened after, not what happened during the crime, but what happened after the crime in terms of the, um, the defendant's rehabilitation and um, behavior since the uh, completion of whatever obligation was presented under the um, under the sentencing provision, so completing either probation or an incarceration period or parole period, again the uh, prosecutor does have the the right to uh, contest, which she has done here today, and I think the um, Ms. Maycumber has picked up on the question that I asked uh, Mr. Garza having to do with given the nature of the crime, what has been done beyond, has he done anything beyond um, the mandatory um, aftercare, sometimes it's called, or rehabilitative process. Uh, to assure the court and the community that he is uh, someone who is no longer a danger. There is automatically some part of that that is understandable in terms of um, just his development. And that is, uh, there's certainly a difference between being 18 and being 29 uh, in terms of some maturity based on studies that have been provided and analysis of crimes that have been committed. So I think there's no, I think there's no question that Mr. Garza has made a lot of progress uh, in the period of time since he committed this crime. I think there's no question that he is uh, working in an area that uh, 
should help him continue to be on track to be a productive member of society. This application comes in a sense at the earliest possible moment allowed under the statute. It does qualify in terms of the legal requirements as Ms. Maycumber has uh, indicated and agreed in the Attorney General's office uh, attempts to uh, outline, uh, including that he's not been involved in any additional criminal activity. Now, you could look at it from the perspective of, yeah, he qualifies based on the specific dates that we're looking at, but that's only because there was a reduction in the sentence I originally um, ordered by way of the boot camp opportunity. I'm not going to get into a debate about that. There are good reasons why the boot camp program exists. And um, there is a um, there, there is specific programming. It's not an easy program to get through, let me put it that way. And Mr. Garza, I assume, has uh, benefited from that, that program. But when it comes to, I, I mean, from the perspective of what he's done, his behavior since the crime, I don't hear anything that is adverse to that. His behavior since the crime has, um, is clearly consistent with the reason for the expungement statute. The only area that I think can be uh, quarreled with is whether setting aside the conviction would be consistent with the public welfare. And part of that is, I think, again, although not outlined clearly in the statute, I think part of that is um, the nature of the crime which then takes us back to the description by the, the victims. And the nature of the crime is such that with all of things I've already said being true, maturity, actions by somebody at that age, and we generally view somewhat differently, um, but the nature of the crime and the timing of this relatively short period of time between when he was, uh, when he completed his programming and now doesn't convince me um, that setting aside the conviction at this moment is consistent with the public welfare. It's not to say, and I know this is not any comfort for the victims, it's not to say that there wouldn't be a time frame in which that would be appropriate and maybe more of an assurance to the community. Um, the statute clearly allows for somebody who has been denied to come back and apply again after the waiting period. Um, I know from what the victims have just said, their position is that it should be a never setting aside, that's really not consistent with what the statute was intended. Again, what the victims may not fully appreciate is that our system of, uh, of government is such that it's not up to me to decide whether there should be an expungement statute. But I have nothing to do with the legislature makes that decision and made that decision. There are people who argue on both sides of that. There was a lot of debate before this uh, statute was adopted. It uh, has been adopted. It's being utilized heavily. Ms. Maycumber and I, I don't know, what do you think, Ms. Maycumber? We see a couple of these a week now. Um, but that's not within my control. My responsibility and assignment is exclusively to apply the statute. And it's pretty clear that the statute by its terms allows somebody to have 
even this level of crime expunged um, and allow somebody who has been denied to come back again and seek it again and show further um, efforts and try to convince the court uh, in terms of the court's discretion, uh, which is that last paragraph that I read. And so um, just as a word of explanation or caution to the family, uh, my decision today doesn't mean that the statute doesn't ever allow him to come back and seek expungement. But today I am going to find that I'm not uh, convinced that it is consistent with public welfare to set aside, Mr. Garza, your conviction at this time. Um, however, I also don't want that to be a discouragement to uh, continued efforts to be a productive member of society and rehabilitation. I understand it's going to thwart your ability to take your next step in terms of employment. That's part of what happens with a felony conviction. You have actually, um, sounds like done fairly well as far as trying to um, rehabilitate and reintegrate in, the, in a productive way in the community. Um, and uh, that is harder than many people realize with a felony conviction. Um, again, I mean, there are reasons for that. You've acknowledged that that's part of what you what you uh, brought upon yourself by the criminal acts that you did. Um, but again, I want to make sure that you continue down the path of being a productive, law-abiding uh, member of society um, and not... Uh, not view this as that uh, somehow we don't understand um, what you have done between the time of completing your obligation to the MDOC and now, but I'm going to deny the, the request at this time. Ms. Maycumber, is there anything else you'd like to put on the record, ma'am? No, Your Honor, thank you. Mr. Garza, is there anything else you'd like to put on the record, sir? Um, I just, I hope when I, uh, when I apply again, that, that you'll find I am making progress still to better myself. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, the Terrell family, thank you very much for appearing today. That concludes this hearing.